Hello fiber friends and welcome to the Jillian Eve channel. I'm Evie and I have a plying problem. My problem is that lately I've been spinning a lot of yarn with my European medieval style spindles and whorls and these don't exactly fit on a clever Kate. And so I need to think of some ways and come up with some solutions to be able to efficiently ply my yarn from these spindles. But I started to wonder, medieval people who were using spindles that look like this, how did they ply that yarn? What tools did they use to ply their yarn? So I think it's time we get a little bit medieval around here. This is better. During the Middle Ages, most cloth was woven entirely from singles yarn. Yes, the warp and the weft was woven from singles yarn. This idea that you can't weave with singles is entirely a myth. We have literally hundreds of years worth of surviving textiles showing us that people did indeed weave with singles. So. Most of the yarn spawned during the Middle Ages intended for weaving would have just been left as a singles yarn. However, there are some situations, and we have evidence of this, where yarn requires to be plied. And two of those are one for tablet weaving, like this belt that I'm wearing, which is in a video if you want to go check that out, and also thread for sewing needs to be plied. Those are two particular uses of yarn that just will not hold up without the ply. So we know that people had to be able to ply their yarn for certain situations and today we use a lot of plied yarn. I especially like a three ply yarn for knitting when I have a lot of surface texture like cables. So what would be the historically accurate way to ply yarn for using spindles like this. I did a bunch of research. I looked at all kinds of pictures that I could find of people doing textile work and I could not find a single picture of anyone actually plying yarn. And so we don't really know exactly what method or methods people used to ply their yarn. So to ply this yarn from these spindles, we're going to have to travel to the land of historically possible as opposed to historically accurate. And we're going to come back to that because I have some thoughts. The plying solution that I want to try out today are these blocks of wood. These were sent to me from the Dancing Goats. Robin over at the Dancing Goats has created these. He's calling them Anatolian plying blocks. Full disclosure, he sent these to me at no charge to me, except I did pay for the shipping, and the link for these in the description below is an affiliate link. It was a fun little collaboration for these, because he sent me a message and said, what kind of wood should I use for these? And I said, well, my name is Evie. Would you like a bite? I'm gonna have to go with apple wood. This is a simple design, easy to make, and made from accessible materials. So I feel that this is certainly a possible solution for people of the past to have used to ply their yarns. When Robin asked if I wanted to have room for two spindles or three spindles, I opted for three because I love the idea that I can create a very usable and modern yarn using historical tools, even if a three-ply yarn wasn't exactly something that we see commonly in medieval Europe. I have two projects that I need to ply. One is this natural colored Shetland wool. I spun this wool with a spindle and distaff, the belted kind like you just saw, and I used a variety of whorls because this is what I was using to test out the clay whorls that I made for my DIY spindle whorl video, and I've decided that this little, this little one here is my favorite. I also got some more medieval spindle whorls, so I had to test those out too, of course. So this is going to become a two-ply yarn, and it was spun from a woolen prep, and I was testing out all kinds of different whorls with this, so I expect it's going to be a little fuzzy and very lumpy. The other project I have is a blend of historical and modern. I wanted to play around with some soapstone 
and alabaster spindle whorls. Soapstone is a very common, uh, commonly found material, and it's also very commonly used for carving in cultures throughout time around the world. And so there have been many soapstone spindle whorls that have been discovered, especially in Northern Europe, and I wanted to try them out, of course, because this is the spinning that I'm really interested in right now. So while these spindle whorls may be replicas of historical tools, this fiber is thoroughly modern. Should we call it Millie? First, this is merino blended with silk in the form of a combed top. Combed top like this is an industrial invention. While people certainly did comb wool in preparation for spinning, it did not come out like the giant floof noodles that we <laughs> see today. Those are prepared for industrial spinning equipment. Definitely a modern preparation. The other modern aspect of this fiber is the color. These bright, really vibrant colors didn't come around until the last century or two. So. I love color, and I guarantee you if people could have achieved these colors, they would have had these colors. Uh, they just didn't have the technology yet, but I do, and so why not put a little splash of color in my yarn while I'm using these historic tools? My plan for this project is to become a three-ply yarn that I will most likely use for a future knitting project. And I also did some color management while I spun this. I divided the braid up so that the colors would repeat in the same order, and then I spun them in the same order. So as they ply, hopefully the colors are going to line up at least a little. So let's put some of these spindles into these wooden plying blocks and start plying. The spindle that I'm going to ply with is this Snyder spindle. It's called the 45. <laughs> Think records and music. And it is one that I've used before for plying and I just really like to ply with this spindle. So this is what I'm going to use. I think it makes sense to start with a two ply and work our way up from there. So I'm going to remove all my whorls and place these into the blocks just like that. Now, right away, I know that this is one thing that has already solved a problem I have sometimes with baskets, which is that sometimes the spindle can slide too far into one side of the basket and then it can fall out of the other side of the basket. Um, but because these have stoppers, obviously it doesn't go all the way through. That's not a problem, so that's pretty cool. For purposes of the video, I'm going to start this out on the table, but I think if I was doing this without having to worry about a camera seeing what I'm doing, I would probably set this on the floor. I did spin these with Z-twist, so I will be plying with S-twist. Well, look at that. This is working great. Oh my goodness. I like the bounce in this yarn. It's fuzzy, but it's not as lumpy as I thought it would be. I think I did better spinning with the spindles and the distaff than I thought I had. That's encouraging. <laughs> This has been a great experience plying from these plying blocks. Like they are so much more efficient than using a basket with holes in it or <laughs> a shoebox with holes in it um, because they stop the spindles from sliding too far and dropping out the other side. So I've had absolutely no problems. They've turned very smoothly. Nothing's gotten caught or hung up or felt like it was rough in any way. Um, 
yeah, it's been great. And I like this yarn. It's coming out a little bit more consistent than I thought it would. So that's always a fun surprise. I guess I'm uh, doing well with my spindle spinning. So yay, practice, that's all it is. Here's my two ply Shetland yarn. It came out beautifully. I'm really happy with this yarn. I got about 70 yards from it. I'm always underestimating how much my spindles can hold because they were not nearly actually full. Um, I could have put a lot more yarn on there. So here it is, it's beautiful. And in the interest of my shoulder, <laughs> <laughs> from plying. I think I'm going to use my spinning wheel next to ply from these three. I have no worries about the plying blocks staying put and holding the spindles exactly where they should be. So I am going to use my Ashford Elizabeth to ply these spindles together. I want to come back to this idea of being historically accurate and plying yarn in a way that's historically accurate to whatever time period. The whole idea that we can create something that is 100% historically accurate is a complete myth. Even if we use the original tools themselves to spin, there is no way to know if our technique is completely accurate. Breeds of sheep have changed through selective breeding over the centuries, and the further back we go, the fewer surviving examples we have of the actual textiles themselves. Operating off an image from an illuminated manuscript or a stone carving can give us some information, but certainly not the full picture. There's just so much we can't know. But I'm not saying that historical reenacting isn't valuable, or that we shouldn't bother to research the past. If you're imposing rigorous standards for good reasons, like a museum recreation or for a specific study, then great. There are so many things we can learn from experimental archeology, span and there are even more things we can discover when we don't hold ourselves to an impossible standard. I will admit that I have been distracted by thinking I need to be accurate enough. If you're a history nerd like me, then let's enjoy the historically possible and let's take what we can learn and use from the past to create new and wonderful things that we can enjoy now. This three ply has almost filled a standard size Ashford bobbin. So this is some good yardage. And it, it just always surprises me how much yardage I get out of my spindles. It never looks like that much on the spindle. And then there it is. <laughs> a full bobbin. <laughs> so this one has come together nicely. It's almost finished. Can't wait to show you this finished yarn because the yarn itself is just really beautiful. Um, but I would love to know from you what solutions have you found if you're a spindle spinner? What do you do if you want to ply the yarn you've spun on your spindles? Do you make a plying ball? Do you you know, what do you, what do you do? How do you manage that so that they don't flop all over the place when you're getting the yarn off of them? Also, tell me what you think of the idea of historical accuracy versus historical possibility. <laughs> I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I think that is a large discussion, a deep discussion. Uh, so if you have thoughts, share them. I will. Be back in just a moment. We're at the very end. I have one spindle about to run out. So I'll be back in just a moment to show you this yarn. 